teach me. Girl. Lord, how do you teach me? Welcome to Radiant Church. My name's Seth. I'm the pastor here. And you guys feeling good tonight? Yeah. How can you not after that worship? Man, you guys, that was awesome. That was so good. And hey, can we, can we by the way, can we just appreciate, you know, I think, uh, uh, Chris and Lanny and Becky and Luke and Aretha and all, all those involved in worship because... That's really, I mean, that's a big commitment. That's a lot of work. You know, it's not just Saturday nights, but I know you guys are here on Friday nights or sometimes Thursday nights just practicing. And so, man, just love you guys. So thankful for, for just, yeah, yeah, just, yeah, leading us in worship. So, so thank you so much. Um, hey, did want to, before we get into the message, just highlight some things we got coming up. Uh, one is in a couple of weeks... Uh, we've got the Great Pie Bake Off happening right after service. And, and really, this is the whole purpose of this, this event is really my not so shameless uh, plug to uh, basically try to convince Pam to make another apple pie. So, um, <laughs> but, but bring your best pie. We're going to have some prizes we're going to give away. That, that's in a couple weeks. Um, so bring that, and we'll just enjoy apple pie, cherry pie, whatever you guys bring for that. Yes, we also got fall back. So, so not only. Boy, not only do you get your whole Sunday in front of you, but you get an extra hour of sleep tomorrow. That's awesome. And, uh, and also, I want to encourage you guys, too, is um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but uh, about 4.15, you know, every, um, every single Saturday night, uh, Rob and Rhea are, are kind of fearless uh, prayer leaders and warriors. Uh, they, they meet downstairs to kind of pray for the service and just pray for you guys and, and us as a church body. And, and I just want to invite you guys out there um, to, to be a part of that. So again, it happens every 4.15, uh, every Saturday night. It's right down there in the fellowship hall. And boy, we'd love to have you uh, come and be a part of that. So, uh, so with that, hey, we are um, we're continuing our series entitled Dangerous Prayers. Dangerous Prayers, where, where we've been sort of talking about some of those prayers that, that even when you utter the words... Like, there's just something about it that kind of gets the heart racing a little bit faster. Like, there's a little bit of a gulp when you say it, right? It's those prayers that, that put at risk our comfort, put at risk our, our, the status quo, the predictable in our lives. And, uh, and last week, we sort of set the stage for this by talking about, about really the hidden potential of prayer, the, the hidden potential of, of getting in the presence of God. And, and we talked about um, how the approach, how we approach prayer really does matter. Uh, you know, our approach matters uh, when it comes to prayer. That prayer at its core isn't about us getting God's attention, but setting our attention onto God. It's not about getting God's attention. You, gotta, you, you already have God's attention. <laughs> but it's about setting our attention onto God and, and the importance of, of really when we go into prayer, starting off really with worship and starting off with that attitude of gratitude or reminding ourselves of the goodness and the greatness and, and the omnipotence of our God and his character. And, and listen, I think for some of us, um, don't, don't just gloss over that and think that's a small statement because I, I think it's got the power and the potential to radically change so many of our prayer lives. Because I think if you, if you really took the time to set your attention onto God and his goodness, his greatness, the character of God, even before we go into all the requests and all those things, I think it would radically change what we ask God about. I think we would pray much bigger prayers than we do. I think we'd pray much bolder prayers than we do. I think we'd pray much more audacious prayers than we do. I mean, when you know that the God of the universe is on your side and, and calls on us to approach his throne boldly, it, it would change the size of our request. In fact, Paul speaks about this in Ephesians 3. Uh, verse 17 says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. 
and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And then, of course, I love verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever imagine uh, or ask according to his power that is at work within us. What's he getting at there? Is that when we go into it, first and foremost with this approach of, hey, I I want to just be in the presence of Jesus. I want to grow my relationship with Jesus. You know, it's amazing how when that relationship grows, as we spend time in his presence, it's amazing how the requests also grow along with it. The requests get bigger, they get bolder, they get more audacious. And again, that's exactly what it says in verse 20. Now to him, again, who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. In other words, you could put it this way. God doesn't always live up to your expectations, but he always lives up to his word. God doesn't always live up to your expectations, but he always lives up to his word. This promise of never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, never will I abandon you. Oh, but, but God, I don't understand. Why didn't you answer this prayer the, the way I thought you should answer it or in the time I thought you should answer it? Hey, listen, think about this. If God always answered your prayers the way you always expected him to, it would never give him the opportunity to exceed your expectations. And that's the promise of his word. That's the promise of our God. And look, I share all that to, to, to say this, is that while that, that, that sounds great, and that, that makes for great preaching, Right? Like, like, God, he's never going to leave you, never forsake you. His promise is there. Hey, hey, how many of you know that, that putting that kind of faith into practice, that that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where the challenge starts to come into play because it's one thing to, to preach that. It's one thing to say that. It's another thing when you're in the midst of the difficulty. You're in the midst of the circumstance. You're in the midst of grief and loss and heartache, and you're wondering what in the world and why is this happening? And, and look, I share that because... Uh, it leads us to really what we're going to focus on and the dangerous prayer we're focusing on tonight, which is this dangerous prayer of help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. In other words, sort of what do we do with our doubt? What do we do with our doubt? Uh, like I, I, I want to believe. I want to believe in Jesus. I want to believe the gospel message. I want to believe that there's a God who is for me and with me, but but, but I got so many questions, and when I, I look at my situation, like, I, I want to believe, but help me with my unbelief. Or, or, I, or, or maybe I do believe. Listen, I believe, Jesus, you're, you're the Lord and Savior of my life, and yet I'm in this season right now where when I look around, and I look around at my work, and I look around at my job, and I look around at the situation and the finances, I, I don't see how anything good can come of this. And it's like, God, I, I believe in you, but help me with my unbelief. And it's, it's this question, it's really this, this plea, it's really this cry, it's this prayer uh, that, that we're going to unpack in a story in Mark chapter 9. And, and, I, and I love this story because here's a guy who's wrestling with this very tension. This wrestling with this tension. Hey, God, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. Belief. And, and so we're going to kind of jump into this and just sort of set the stage of, of kind of the story. And we're going to read through it and then we're going to come back to it and, and sort of unpack it. Um, but basically, it's, it's a father who's, uh, whose son is, is possessed and, and being tormented by this evil spirit. And, uh, and he's taken him to every doctor. He's taken him to everybody he knows. And no one can seem to figure out the, their answer. No one can seem to find the solution to the condition that his son is suffering with. And so this is, this is where we catch up to him, because he, he finds out that Jesus is in town, and, and, so, um, and so they approach Jesus with this situation. And so in verse 20 of Mark 9, it says, So they brought the boy, but when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion, and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening, Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, Since he was a little boy... The Spirit often throws him into the fire or into water trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean if I can, Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers was growing, he he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that, that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. He said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. But the spirit 
screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. A murmur ran through the crowd as people said, he's dead, but Jesus took him by the hand, helped him to his feet, and he stood up. Afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, hey, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? And Jesus replied, this, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. You know, I love this story because, I, again, I, I think um, it really unpacks and really reveals uh, a, lot of, a lot of our struggles sometimes with this concept of faith, you know, especially what effective faith really means. Because I think for a lot of us, we think effective faith, kind of healing faith, miraculous faith is sort of void of doubt, a void of any uncertainty, a faith that is always full, sort of 100% certain. You know, there's no room for for mistake, no room for questions. And I think especially when we come into, into a place like this, when we come into church, we can especially kind of walk into this with this sort of mindset when it comes to faith. You know, we, we enter this place of faith and, and we can sometimes kind of come into it and think that there's no, it leaves no room for doubt. That, that, that church is sort of this place for people who have it all figured out, who don't have any questions, you don't have any doubts. You don't have any worries. And they're like, God said it. I believe it. And that settles it, right? You know, but the truth is, listen, if we could be honest for a moment, all of us, on some level, we struggle with this tension. We, we believe or we want to believe, and yet at the same time, we also struggle with unbelief. We believe, but we also have doubts. We have faith, but we also have fears. We trust, but we're also worried things aren't going to go turn out the way that we hoped that they would. And again, that's why I love this story, because it's so raw, and it's so honest, and it's so transparent. And it really kind of gets to, I think, some of the core reasons that, that lead to some of our doubts, that, that re lead to, to some of these, these kind of questions of, of unbelief that sometimes we hold on to. The, the first one is this. Uh, that we see in the story is one is we can't reconcile God's power with our pain. Uh, one of the, the first reasons of, of why we sometimes struggle with unbelief, we struggle with doubt and clouds our view of faith is we struggle to reconcile God's power with our pain. Um, years ago, I remember I, making a quick stop over. I got to spend uh, just a short time in London, and, and I would say really short time, like literally it was like six hours that we had before we had to get back to the, to the airport. And so, uh, so we're, we're making our way through London. You get to the subway station, and, and when you get to the subway station there in London, uh, one of the first things you notice is all these signs all over the place that, that say, mind the gap. Mind the gap. And, and basically, it's to draw attention of, of, you know, just being cautious where you where, where you set foot, you know, with that, that little gap between the platform and, and stepping onto the subway train. And look, I share that because I, I think it's a, it's a great illustration, it's a great picture of, I think, what gets so many of us stuck in this area of faith, is that we, rather than even more than just, you know, you know making a step into the gap, we, we get stuck in the gap. And, and when I say gap, I mean this, this gap between the promise of God in your life and the reality of your current situation and this gap of doubt. But like, God, when I, I look at my situation, when I look at what's going on around me, I'm struggling to believe. Like, I know you've given me this promise. I, I know your word tells me this. But, but in light of the reality, in light of this current situation, in light of the pain I'm going through, I'm struggling to believe. And that, that's exactly kind of what we see is going on in this story. Look at verse 17 and 22. Here's his dad. He says, I brought you my son. It has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. Um, in Luke's uh, translation and kind of version of the story, he actually describes it as the man's only child. I mean, and talk about the heartache. I mean, you, you can hear the pain in this guy. I mean, you know, this is his only, this is his boy, his only son. And he, he's tried everything, and he has no answers and, and doesn't understand what's going on. And he's wrestling with this pain. God, I know you've promised me healing. I know you've promised me some good things are going to come out of this. But, but right now, all I see is heartache. Right now, all I see is pain. And you see this, this hurt, this doubt created by this gap of pain. You know, it might, might surprise you to hear that, but, but actually, we, we see... Um, this kind of line of doubt, <laughs> actually throughout Scripture. 
Actually, we see this even with some of the heroes of the faith, some of the fathers of the faith. You know, amazing examples of what faith looks like. And yet even they had times, they had seasons where they walked through some doubt. And especially doubt caused by pain. In fact, maybe the most notable um, character in the Bible where we see this is, is in the life of Job. Entire book, <laughs> kind of, you know, talking about this guy's struggle to, to live out faith and to keep on hoping and, and, you know, clinging on to this promise of God when he's going through so much pain. I mean, here's a guy who in, in one day loses his family, loses his job, loses his dog. I mean, it sounds like a country song that's gone incredibly wrong, Right? And, and, and in one sense, and when you read it, in one sense, he'll make some incredible statements of faith. Uh, like in one sense, uh, one verse, he says, though, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Incredible statement of faith. And yet I find it amazing that here's this guy, you know, even through such pain, you know, still has, has faith, but, but he's also wrestling with doubts. In fact, check this out. In Job 14, 19, he says, As waters wear away the stones and floods wash away the soil of the earth, so you, O Lord, destroy the hope of man. Now, let's be honest. Nobody's putting that verse on a bracelet, right? <laughs> like, like, hey, guys, thank you for coming out tonight. Make sure you grab your the Lord destroys hope bracelet on the way out. <laughs> Kids, you know, and, and then their class is like, hey, all right, guys, memory verse to tell your parents, you know, Lord destroys hope, you know. No, nobody's doing that. But, but you see this. You see this tension, faith and doubt. You know, even in Jeremiah, um, you know, he's known as the weeping prophet. Uh, here's this guy who had this incredible promise of God for the people of Israel uh, that he was, you know, kind of commissioned and called to share. And yet, yet when he looked at the pain, of the people Israel were going through right now, or in this moment, he struggled with it. In fact, in Jeremiah 15, 18, he says, Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable, which refuseth to be healed? Wilt thou be altogether unto me as a liar and as waters that fail? In other words, he literally, in the midst of his death, he calls God a liar. Now, I, I grew up in, like, scary church. Like, you didn't say that. Like, you know, like kind of like, you call God a liar. I mean, you better expect like a lightning bolt from heaven to come and incinerate you. But again, you see this. You see this tension of faith and doubt, and you see some of this doubt uh, that, that one of the, the, the leading components behind it oftentimes is the pain, that, that gap between the promise of God and the reality and the pain we're going through right now. The second thing is this, is that, um, that sometimes creates our doubts in life is we've been discouraged by his disciples. We've been discouraged by his disciples. As again in the story, again, it started with pain. My, my son, since he was a baby, had this problem. He's under attack. He's suffering. I don't know what to do. And, and on top of it, Jesus, I, I went to church. <laughs> and they couldn't help me there. Like, like your disciples, they, they said there was help. And, and, and they couldn't do anything for me. Mark 9, 18 says it this way. It says, I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. In other words, I, I tried it. I tried the whole church thing. I tried the Jesus thing. I tried the faith thing, and it just, just didn't seem to work out for me. You ever been there? You ever, ever kind of gotten around uh, some, some other uh, you know, believers or quote-unquote believers in Jesus, and, and like you got around them, and, and you kind of left more discouraged than when you came in? <laughs> Maybe you went to a church, and you, you left more discouraged than when you came in, and this is not the time to name any churches, uh, especially if that one's there. Well, our hope is that you would leave this place always encouraged and always hopeful. But, 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 but you, you, those times can happen where you, where you kind of get stuck in these places. I've shared this with a few people before that um, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with pastoral conferences. Um, the love, <laughs> probably no, yeah. Um, when you go there, you know, it's, you always go there, and, and more often than not, I, I always go there, Holly and I go there, and, and you get encouraged, and there's always these kind of great messages, like, you guys can make it, you make it through, and it's great, you know, kind of, you know, uh, just really fuels the faith, and yet, yet when I go to these same conferences, inevitably, there's always one speaker, or there's one person we run into, and when they describe ministry, they describe it like a Hallmark movie, <laughs> like, like, I came in, how's it going for you? Going amazing, going amazing. We launched our church a year ago, started with two people. We're at 2,000 now. Excellence. 
Okay, so like, have you had any, any, like, any heartache, any trouble, any challenges? Yeah, no, can't think of anything. You know, hashtag blessed to be me. You know, I mean, just... Hey. And, and again, you know, our, our lives, you know, I mean, you guys know what this feels like. I mean, you go on Facebook and you see, you know, other believers, you know, other, you know, Christ followers, and it just looks like on the surface, like, like their lives are perfect. They have it all together. They got the perfect family, they got the perfect house, they got the perfect job, they got the perfect lives, and they just seem to have it all together. And in light of that, you walk away just feeling like, man, God, what about me? And you see this doubt that kind of raises up, like, like God, I know you got promises for me, and they're, they're good, and they're for a future, and yet right now, and, and looking at, compared, comparing my life and my situation to others, I'm having a hard time seeing it. You know, or the flip side of that is, is when we run into disciples who, who don't maybe have it so much all together, but their lives just seem like a total wreck. You know, like when, like you, you get around them and, and the challenge for us ends up being not this gap between the reality, reality of my pain and his promise, but, but this gap between those who claim to be followers of Jesus and Jesus himself. In fact, I, I think it was Gandhi who said, listen, I like your Jesus, I like your Christ, but I'm just not a fan of your Christians. Because your Christians are so unlike your Christ. 